I think, you know, LA is sort of this, um, you know, LA is a, LA is a place that is formed in opposition to its environment, right? Right, in a way. I mean, we live in a Mediterranean climate, um, but we pipe in all our own water. We bring electricity from miles and miles away. We, you know, I, I think that we, we sustain ourselves through a sort of into, an infrastructural feats of, you know, extraordinary proportion that has made Los Angeles what it is. But I don't know if those sorts of, I guess my feeling is that those sorts of heroic infrastructural projects, as inspirational as they are to me, I mean, the Hoover Dam is a wonder. Um, uh, I don't know if that's how we can live in the future. That. know if that's how we can live in the future. That we need to, I think, think through the actual specifics of the place in which we live and build communities that then are more symbiotic with those environments rather than to make a new within a place that is not intended to be that way. Right. Efficiency is the word that comes to mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, efficiency in a way, and and a kind of um, a kind of a kind of conditioning that that a conditioning that makes a uh, um, that 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 makes a kind of uh, a, a sort of nice average. Do you know what I mean? Like it's never too hot and it's never too cold. It's just perfectly seventy-two degrees, right? Well. It's okay if you're a little hot. It's okay if you're a little cold, right? You're actually more in tune with your environment at that point. And it doesn't, we don't need to uh, sort of establish ourselves at some neutral state of which we are then separate from that environment in some way. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And, uh, and I think similarly, that speaks towards maybe building systems and mechanical systems. I'm speaking towards like air conditioning and those kinds of things. But it could also speak towards how we plan communities. I mean, if you look back and see how, not that we need to be completely historicist or harken back to a better age, right? That's not what I'm, that's not what I'm proponent, that's not what I'm being a proponent of, but I think that you can, there are lessons to be learned from earlier ways of doing things that you can then take into contemporary thinking through technology and other forms of innovation and update them towards living in the 21st century. Um, sure, like what were you know, those in the in the, day, the the air cooling systems that were on top of the house that were protruding? Yeah, I, I forgot what they what they were called, but there are these sort of like um, wind. Uh, uh, what are they called? They're uh, sort of chimneys. They yeah. come up, but as opposed to exp ex uh, uh, expelling hot air, sure, they're actually catching air and bringing it in for natural ventilation. Sure, and then you have like an exhaust, natural exhaust systems. Well, you could get right. that and then refine it and you know add some modern components and some new materials and absolutely and just make it all um, yeah more efficient. I, w I would say, you know, talking to you. And as a, you know, you are an architect, yeah. and you are part of this community. You've just experienced, you know, this situation. Um, you own, you're a part owner of, of your community, and it's very democratic. Um, does the community look to you as an architect to help the conversation and how you're going to rebuild and now soon to be? landscape architect like <laughs> um kind of a, an analogy where you know we, in our pre-interview we were talking about like it's almost as if you know you were in a car and you guys broke down yeah and someone says is there a mechanic and, yeah i'm the mechanic I'm, yeah I'm, I'm an architect here um is that 
starting to happen now that there's been some reflection? I, a, a bit. A friend of mine, actually a neighbor across the street from me, um, was a, is an architect as well. So we've been talking and we've been strategizing how to help organize all these efforts. Um, it's a it's a circumstance now where, so a bit they're asking, you know, um, but everyone's so still in shock. Mm. Everyone's still, I mean, there are issues now of, I mean, we are very lucky. Our family is very lucky that we have an apartment. I have a job. <laughs> you know, we have money. You know, we're, we're okay. We're going to be okay. There are people who are not in our community who are really had nothing. And, um, and so a lot of the efforts right now that are being put on by the community are just trying to get them. Do you have food? Do you have shelter? Do you have clothing? Are you okay? What about mental health as well? And mental health. So the Malibu foundation, um, and then there's this, another organization is, is actually has raised tons of money. Um, and a lot of that money is going towards mental health and helping out, helping people get through this situation and of every age, children to elderly. Um, so at this point, we're, we're at this point of, we're in this, we're at this point between after the tragedy, after the fire, people are getting their bearings a little bit, but a lot of people are still just trying to get on their feet. And now we're starting to think through the process of rebuilding a little bit. And so, yeah, a friend of mine, George, and I are now planning or helping to work with, we have a board that helps to represent the overall community, working with the board to help strategize this whole redevelopment. And uh, it's going to be a process. There's there's debris removal. There's um, Then there's all the infrastructure was completely destroyed. The roads, the water, the sewer, the electrical. So it's essentially rebuilding the town. You can think of it as a small town of roughly 400 people um, rebuilding that town from scratch mm -hmm. almost. And so we're trying to think through ways of helping that process along. Um, and was it an opportunity as well to like, now you could put the electrical subgrade, right? That's exactly like, right. Like, like there's uh, now we could, because I'm imagining all the electrical was above and traditional poles, right? Well, we had some of that, but a lot of it was already underground. Okay. But it did give us an opportunity to do some of that. Mm -hmm. It will give us an opportunity sure. to do some of that. Um, as well as just reorganize a lot of the infrastructure that was in very strange places. Right. And I know in Australia, the, their big thing to, to, to combat is cisterns mm -hmm. and water uh, capturing and... Um, you know, so it's like you could start combining these really intelligent systems. Like, let's put, let's go subgrade, let's put cisterns, let's have water, let's collect this. You know, let's use exactly. materials here. Um, maybe, you know, thicker gravel paths and, of course, smart planting and mm -hmm. zones and, you know, just every single possible system that you can do. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And that's... That's sort of the, that's part of the stuff we're starting to think through, and a lot of this is um, it's interesting you bring up cisterns and stormwater management and that kind of thing because that's that's a huge part of this, um, both in relationship to just normal uh, recapture or capture, um, but looking at that at the community level, but then also the individual level, uh, and but with regard to water as well as this idea of 
mitigating slides in the future too. So how do we start to think of the landscape kind of outside the community and then working in collaboration with um, public lands of which we're surrounded by, we sort of live within our community is a privately owned entity, but we live smack in the middle of public lands. So collaborating with other public agencies to think about the landscape outside of our area as well and what can be done there. Um, so as I said, we're kind of a, we're a democracy, we're a sort of little dem you know, democratic community. And so it's not just as though we're gonna walk in and say, okay, I'm a mechanic, for example, like sure. I got my tool set, here we go, just sit over there and have a sandwich and we're gonna be fine. It's a process of education and uh, a process of community involvement where, because these, although there are systems in place that will be sort of at a macro scale, for lack of a better term, um, each individual also has the opportunity to operate within their own property in other kinds of ways. So. It's educating them that, hey, as you redevelop your, your individual parcel, you can think of these mm -hmm. systems as well and different ways of building, different ways of planning the land, different ways of uh, attaching into sustainable systems. Um, and so we're in the process actually right now of putting together a kind of uh, educational presentation or series of presentations that will will roll out and have a set of town hall meetings and talk to people about this over the course of the next, oh gosh, I don't know, sure. a long time. So <laughs> six, we have probably year. guest consultants and yes. just all kinds of different experts in different fields. Absolutely, um, yeah. You know, I could even imagine with a series of cisterns, you could have pumps and even your own little micro fire. Exactly. You know, type station and yeah um, yeah exactly I think the way you can think through localized like almost personalized infrastructure in a way mm -hmm. sort of like individual infrastructure that is not just about gathering water but also about, like you say about fire prevention or other kinds of things could be really cool yeah very yeah. interesting um, yeah, so it's a kind of an exciting time to, it's like I said in the beginning, it's, um, it's, it's, it's extremely challenging to have gone through it and it's in a certain way we're still grappling with the emotions of all of that, but with the promise of the rebuild and the promise of a kind of, of a kind of regeneration comes optimism and um, a kind of a renewed, spirit in a certain way that comes out of the tragedy and I think that that's uh, it's like the fable of a phoenix you know in a way yeah you know rising yeah. up to the ashes and yeah and it just feels um, you know the one thing that I wasn't necessarily I can't say I was I've always been a firm believer in the power of society and the power of community to lift everybody up and um and it's very rare that you, that I have had the experience of, or had the, the opportunity to experience that. And that's what I experienced primarily after the, was just, not just the overwhelming amount of support, which was like a sort of a tidal wave of support. Almost, you couldn't even get your head around, you couldn't even get your visual field around all the people that were coming to help you. But that the generosity and the spirit that it, 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 it sort of embeds in every single person you run across and that it, it proves it proves that people are stronger together than they are separately. It proves that society is better when you're working together and you're looking out for everybody and that the nature of the human spirit is really that. And so as we move forward, everybody has their own kind of individual interests, but trying to think through that as a kind of collective still is really um, 
what I think is really spurns the most kind of hope um, and sort of positivity that could come out of something like this, you know? Um, so yeah, that's why it's kind of like it's, it was bad, but boy, there's a lot of good things that are coming out of this too, so it's nice. It's, it's, Yeah, so that was a, that's a foundation that was uh, created by a set of residents in our community, um, and it's uh, it's for the purpose of helping to rebuild the community and the lives of the people in the community. So uh, it's in it's been working in conjunction with the Malibu Foundation, which is similar entity but for Malibu. Uh, that helps to raise money for individuals, um, their personal needs, their, uh, and also raise money for services, as you were saying, for mental health or other kind of supportive services for people in that community who really need it. And, um, and then it also goes towards the uh, money goes towards the hiring of consultants and the actual execution of the rebuilding of the community. So um, it's a nonprofit that was started. And um, so, yeah, it's about a month and it's, it's been around for about a month now. And, uh, and so it, it's already starting to reap some benefits for a lot of people. And, um, the, the intent of the of the fund is to really go to the people who need it the most. Um, there are some people in the community who don't need it as much, and so they won't be part of it. Um, but yeah, it's an effort to really try and rebuild us. And it's an important community within the Santa Monica Mountains um, for a lot of different reasons, and not just because it's mine. It is, um, it's, a, it's been a part of this area for uh, 100 years and um, in one form or another. And um, I think that the, the character and the nature of Cornell in this area is it's better served by places like this existing. Mm. So. You know, typically during an interview, I was kind of, ask people what their out is like, like what, kind of like what their escape is and people say yoga and people say meditation uh -huh. and learning or, you know yeah. and um in this situation you know i kind of want to reframe that question and be like is there a particular type anchor that you're using to kind of escape a little bit like you know just for mm -hmm. a moment you know some people after a situation like this, they'll just fully focus on work or, mm. you know, is, is there anything that comes to mind? Is there anything that you're doing in regards to just a moment of... Um, not so much, honestly. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. It's been, uh, it's been, um, actually went to a gym to see if I could get a membership you know, that kind of thing uh, recently. But um, it's honestly, it's just been survival mode. Yeah. It's just been, you know, uh, we've been in our apartment for about two weeks now or maybe a little longer than that, two and a half weeks or so. It's just, you know, can I get a spoon? You know, it's those kinds of things that it's the little victories of that actually make you feel a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we take our dogs for a walk to the dog park. That's always we have animals, we have pets, so they become our escape. Um, my daughter has found a lot of solace in our, and we found solace in our community. I think probably out of anything that's been it is that if it wasn't for our friends and my daughter's friends, um, we would be in a much different place than we are right now, um, just more emotionally. And so,
going to people's house for Thanksgiving, going to people's houses for just get together or to for New Year's Eve or for Christmas. Um, we've been invited kind of everywhere to partake in all of that. And I think those are the moments that help you the most. It will transform into individual, you know, um, I'll get exercising again and we'll start doing those things again. My daughter will get back into a routine with school again, which she hasn't been in for almost two months now into a routine. It's been this very intermittent. Um, and I think those kinds of things will also help. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure how that will be. The, the going back to a routine that existed prior with the new reality that you live in currently, how those two things kind of conflate. It's a different paradigm. It's, it, it's, it is. It is. Yeah. And so we'll see how all that goes. But, um, but right now it's, uh, you know, just sort of taking, uh, I feel like we've, towards the end of 2018 now into the beginning of 2019, um, we've had a chance to kind of catch our breath a little bit more than we had before. And so now I've been saying to people, you, it was very hard to, there's a sort of adage of living in the present, trying to live in the present that I've always, I've always wanted to aspire to and tried to aspire to, but it's very difficult. Um, and afterwards, looking back was way too painful. Looking forward was way too daunting. Mm. It was just like, I can't even think about what this is good. How are we even going to do this? So you live within like a two to three day increment. Mm. And so you're sort of forced into this living in the present mode, just through a sort of uh, emotional survival in a certain way. And, sure. and that has come, that has sustained us to a certain level, like I think in two to three day increments. Um, but now we're starting to get a little bit of our breath and we are thinking a little bit forward now. And that's part of working with the community that's part of just my wife and I saying, okay, now what do we do? Just even asking that question, where are we going now? What are we gonna do now? Just being able to ask those questions without it, the sort of sort of fear factor. I feel like them. that process is gonna, is gonna be a little bit like a balance between expansion and contraction, expansion and contraction. It's Absolutely. gonna be like, Expand, expand. Oh, too far. Come back. Absolutely. Come back in a little bit. In both ways, in the past as well. Like, yeah. you're thinking about it. You expand. You get a little bit comfortable. Oh, too hurtful. Come back in. And then just, and then eventually, ideally, it should plateau to like some kind of normalized, like healthy way of going back and forth. It will eventually. I think it's with anything. It will, um, you know, it's one of those things. It's you, 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 you referred it to, or you referenced it similarly to like a death in the family. I think it's kind of like that, um, where it's immediately very difficult. Then you get into a life, and then all of a sudden something just pops up, and you remember. Oh, sure. And then it comes flooding back in a certain way. And I would, I guess, I would tend to think that over time. It will come back, but it comes back as a kind of melancholy, mm. as a kind of fond, you know what I mean? Sad, but fond memory. Um, I hope that's true for my daughter the most. Mm. And uh, so just having the faith that eventually it will all, it will all work out. And I think part of the seeing the other, seeing other people it's all very personalized in a certain way. So being part of it, it's something nice being part of the community is that if we had our own parcel, 
you know, independent single lot, it would really feel, I think, as though we're, we're forging through by ourselves and here we go. And of course, there's all these other people maybe around us who would experience something, but you are, you are, you have a lot of self-interest, just naturally. Here, we have self-interest, but the self-interest is interwoven with the larger community. And so you're always in this dialogue and feedback. Both with, socially and legally. Uh, of course, it's everything. So it's yeah. this interesting tie between the individual, what you're going through individually. You can then completely understand what somebody else is going through individually. Because then they're all because they're living next, they live next door to you. They're your friends, but also they're tied up in this overall development of the community. And that's, um, it's hard, it's, it's, it's hard sometimes, but it's also healing in a lot of different ways. And you don't feel as though you're completely in it by yourself, which is nice for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any closing any closing thoughts? Um, I don't know. I think, um, you know, I, I, I think that the, for, for me, the, there's a lot of, um, whenever I talk to people about this, everyone focuses on, oh my gosh, you're, and I, and I really appreciate, oh my gosh, your house, and what are you going through? And that's all, very much appreciated and heartfelt. Um, but I hope what comes out of all of this, and what I really, it's it's thing where, you, you know, something happens in your life, you hear about people who something happens in their life, and it changes their life. And for me, as we were talking earlier about like the ASLA stuff, right? It's like, yeah, yeah, I'm doing this thing and it's, I'm super interested in it, it's important. Now it's almost like a life mission. And it's, and it's something where I have a newfound appreciation for the world in which we live right now and the the actions that the human race needs to take on in order to make this a better place for our kids and future generations. And that what I'm interested in is one small part of that, but I really feel as though that, 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 that there's a, that people look at these issues around climate change or around sort of fire sequencing in Southern California from whatever perspective that they're coming through, whether that's economics or that's um, sort of design or that's uh, sort of urban planning or it's whatever it might be and find ways in which we can really address these issues in a significant way to change are to reverse, no, we're not going to reverse, but actually start to maybe shift our ways of existing on this planet. And I love that we live in California because I think California is one of the, like the, the, um, on the forefront of really trying to do a lot of these things. But if you look within the overall sphere of the world and California, we are a micron doing lots of great things, but we're nowhere going to change the world. And we need to have global movements that are, that really significantly shift the politics of our country and the world that really help to take on these issues. And I hope that the design community of which I exist, I'm not an economist, but I, you know, or other kinds of things, but I, I'm a designer and I hope that the design community really takes these issues on in a significant way. So anyway, that's my hope. And that's what I'm going to try and do.